This is the Vietnam familiar to the world. Vietnam is still all these things. But from the chaotic streets, there is a new Asian force rising up where the cities are redefining their skylines, a place few would recognize as Vietnam. Changes take place every minute, every day you see something new. Young professional now, they, they seem to be so free spirit. People are trying to build what will be tomorrow's great companies. In this program, we're going to see this transformation through the eyes of the Vietnamese themselves. But we will also bring another perspective, a third eye, cast by expert commentators who will give their assessment of where Vietnam is now and where it's going. Go Professor John Weeks has written widely on development issues. Banu Baweja is head of emerging markets at a major bank. And Danny Richards is from the Economist Intelligence Unit. The first time I went to Vietnam and I worked with the man who was uh, secretary to the prime minister, and he said to me, uh, it takes a communist to build capitalism. And I think that that tells you part of the story of Vietnam. So there's real pride in the way the country has developed, but there's a long way to go yet before it really is seen as one of the leaders in the, in the Southeast Asia region. Vietnam is the rising dragon of the East, if you consider the growth numbers, but it is a dragon on steroids. There is an energy here. Even an IT fair calls for cheerleaders and dance troops. It's a vigor that comes from a growing economy and a very young population. In a country of 87 million people, 60% are under 35 years of age. There's also a new generation of middle-class Vietnamese educated at universities in the West who have now returned home, bringing an international mindset and capitalist dreams to this socialist-orientated market economy. People like Henry Nguyen, a Harvard graduate who heads a venture capitalist company in Ho Chi Minh City. I guess I'll co-opt a phrase from the, the Clinton campaign, you know, it's the demographics, stupid. You know, like, it's, this is a young, up-and-coming country. People here are very ambitious, very optimistic, very hardworking. Um, and because of that, you know, you basically have uh, a country, really, that is literally on its way up. It's growing up right before our eyes. Um, I don't consider myself that old a person, but 70% of Vietnam is younger than I am. Um, and that makes me kind of a gray hair here, uh, somewhat prematurely. Take this internet technology company. The average age here is 28. Designers, programmers, and marketing managers. The CEO was a champion gamer who bet on Vietnam's young workforce and hungry consumer habits. We, we've seen things happening in the last five years, and we say, like, you know, with the internet coming in, with technology being introduced to people, we, we could become the brand of the world. I mean, like competing with the best brand out there. Vietnam is seen by some as the rising dragon of the East. The communist government has transformed a war-torn country on the brink of starvation into a place of emerging market opportunity. But change here is carefully controlled. Things have really changed in the last 10, 20 years. But there's still a sense of the Communist Party having this controlling mentality where it's really reluctant to go the whole way. I think it will remain screened. I think that the Vietnamese government is not about to just open things up. And it's particularly, it's not about to uh, let foreign investors enter into a uh, bidding match over uh, Vietnamese resources. Not having said that, 
If you're a foreign investor, you can make a lot of money in Vietnam. Shaped like an elongated S, Vietnam covers the surface area of 300,000 square kilometers, roughly the size of Italy or the Philippines. Being close to China, Laos and Cambodia places it in a very strategic location. This is made in Vietnam as we know it. The main exports are garments, textiles and crude oil, and the country is still a major supplier of rice and coffee. Vietnam is one of Southeast Asia's fastest growing economies, setting its sights on becoming a developed nation by 2020. Pham Chi Lan worked as a financial consultant to the government for 20 years. Well, I think the pace of uh, growth in Vietnam is quite good, with uh, almost 7.2% uh, of the GDP growth of all over two decades continuously. And even during the crisis in the, the world or in the region, Vietnam could uh, still maintain some uh, positive growth. And I think that's uh, quite good. Of course, we do want to see the country develop faster in future. Economic reform started in 1986. There was a seismic shift from a planned economy to a socialist oriented market economy. The Vietnamese word for this is doi moi. They looked to the outside world to see how they could improve the lives of their people. Vietnam um, started the reform when we were isolated. Um, but with the reform, we decided to open the door to develop our uh, trade and business relations with uh, all uh, countries in the world. That's possible for Vietnam by then. And we uh, uh, have a slogan that Vietnam wants to make friends with every country in the world. They looked at the Soviet Union in the, in the early 1990s and they say, this cannot happen here. <coughs> politically and economically. So how are they going to prevent that? One was to manage the transition. The other thing about uh, Vietnam is nationalism. Vietnamese nationalists became socialists because they were nationalists, not the other way around. If Vietnam doesn't slow down right now, it needs to slow down credit, it needs to raise interest rates, it needs to rein in the external deficit. Um, if it doesn't do that, I'm afraid that this, we are headed towards bubble territory. Every morning, thousands of Vietnamese people start their day with a steaming bowl of pho, noodles in an aromatic beef broth. It's a street food normally found in doorways and side alleys. But the breakfast dish has had a modern makeover. Lee Kui Trung is part of a new generation educated in the West who have returned home. We gave uh, the, the customers, the people, um, uh, more options, you know, like more modern, you know, modern look, modern service, um, you know, modern style, lifestyle, uh, uh, eating culture. But uh, it's going to be uh, replacing the traditional uh, way of eating pho. Uh, I think the traditional way is also beautiful. So uh, they both survive the modern and traditional way. Seven years in, his chain of eateries has 78 cafes throughout Asia. This year, 200 more will roll out across Japan and the United States. In a way, this simple noodle dish symbolizes the new change in power, where the old rules of the 20th century are being turned on their head. Traditional way is that the West come to the East, but I love to see a lot of brands, a lot of things coming out from the East to the West. And uh, it's, uh, it's the way it should be, you know, it's the, the fair exchange. And it's, uh, it's, it's a good thing for the global market. And um, I think uh, there will be a lot more brands, a lot more concepts, business from the East to the West, because the East is uh, young and becoming, you know, new, you know, and, and a lot of energy. A bowl of pho on the street costs just under a dollar. The same dish in Trung's cafes is double that. Vietnam's new middle class is willing and able to pay. 10 years ago, only 28% of the population were middle class. Today, in the cities, that figure is estimated to be around 64%.
At this high-end store aimed at expats, Tip Huang found her customers turned out to be largely locals. The Vietnamese between 20 and 30 um, years old now, um, they're just different from how I see I was when I was 20 and 30. You know, they, they, they have no, it seems that they have no, they don't look far. They don't live in that mode where, um, you know, our parents used to live where you have to save, save, save because you never know what's tomorrow. You never know what Vietnam's gonna become tomorrow. They seem to be much more free spirit. Urban Vietnam has mobile phones, broadband and spending power. They want upmarket street food. They want sophisticated shopping experiences. But rural Vietnam, which is still 75% of the population, is being left behind. The UN says a quarter of people here live on below $1.25 a day. It's a deepening divide posing, some say, the nation's greatest threat. Do Duc Ding, who works at the Vietnamese Academy of Social Sciences, says this presents a major challenge. There's still uh, big gaps, and uh, in the future, uh, I think that uh, we need to have a, a new model uh, that combines uh, high growth and uh, equity. I think the government needs to keep a very keen eye on social unrest, uh, especially in an economy which is overheating. Uh, because unlike the developed world, in the developing world, food prices comprise a very large part of overall consumer basket. And if food prices in particular and consumer prices in general are rising, it's a big tax on the have-nots. If you begin to get ostentatious displays of wealth, which I think you're beginning to get now, I think there's going to be quite a social strain. I think that that is probably the greatest danger that the government faces. In Vietnam's capital, Hanoi, a stroll around Huan Kiem Lake at dawn is a walk through the country over the centuries. At one end of the lake, you find the older generation practicing Tai Chi left by the Chinese. Further around, there's ballroom dancing from the French. And on the eastern side, there's a noisy aerobics class of women working out to Western techno dance music. The Vietnamese have a tradition of absorbing foreign ideas and making it their own. It's a flexibility that gives the nation a significant asset. The thinking of uh, the Vietnamese people are very positive, and, and that's important. Uh, everybody thinks that tomorrow is better and, and, and uh, we, we can do something tomorrow. So, and we don't have time to think of the past. So that's the key element for uh, the, the fast development of, of the economy. Vietnam's major cities, Hanoi, Ho Chi Minh, and Da Nang, are reaching for the future. A symbol of that rise is the Bitexco Financial Tower. It's 262 meters high, with Vietnam's first helipad at the 52nd floor, defying gravity on the side of the building. This $270 million investment was constructed entirely with Vietnamese money and ambition, the vision of self-made businessman Mr. Vu Quang Hoi. Trước cái thời gian xây dựng cái đó thì tôi đã nung nấu mong muốn là thế hệ trẻ chúng tôi phải làm được cái gì để cho đất nước chúng tôi thay đổi. Và chính điều đó thì tôi suy nghĩ là một trong những cái biểu tượng sức mạnh đó là gì? Thì phải tạo ra một cái tòa nhà rất là cao, tòa nhà rất là đẹp, cũng là thể hiện cái sức mạnh. Và chính vì thế thì trong quá trình lung nấu đó tôi đã quyết định để xây dựng cái tòa nhà này. Henry Nguyen's venture capitalist firm will be one of the first tenants to move into the building. Located about 10 minutes from the main center, he predicts this new financial district will eventually become Saigon's version of Wall Street question of just this building being sort of juxtaposed to, I'll say, 
old Saigon is is very striking. You know, I think one of the reasons that we really wanted to move in here was it's it's a vantage point to watch, you know, on a 360 degree basis the changes in the city. This first skyscraper was built entirely with Vietnamese dong, but the country needs more foreign investment for other projects. It's estimated about $120 billion is required for railways, roads, electricity, and water supplies. Though the government is injecting cash, Vietnam's poor infrastructure, underqualified workforce, bureaucratic red tape, and an economy dominated by large state-owned groups may keep the country from meeting its economic potential. You've got the lower level officials who should be making decisions, but they need to get the approval of those further up the chain. And, and it go, sometimes it goes right up to the Prime Minister's desk. So there's this lack of uh, devolved decision making in Vietnam. Truth be told, um, the problem is actually less so compared to some of the other emerging market economies, right? Uh, I mean, if you consider how long it how long it takes to open up a private company in a country like Vietnam compared with India, Vietnam compares favorably, right? Um, where you have lack of transparency is policy settings. Growth has come at a cost. According to the General Statistics Office of Vietnam, inflation hit 11.8% in December 2010 on a year-on-year -year basis. The dong has been devalued three times since last year and there is a current account deficit of $2 billion. Dang Tang Tum is one of Vietnam's most successful businessmen. He says growth is good, but it's still not enough. For this year, our growth rate is 6.7%, but actually in inflation, 11%. If growth rate 6.7%, inflation need to be the same or lower. It means the real economy is still growing. Yeah, and that's why Vietnam need much to, to improve. Some people say that Vietnam is planning to become an industrial economy uh, by the uh, 2020. But it, in my view, it may be 2040 or 2050. The government wants to modernize and holds up this factory just outside Ho Chi Minh City as an example. US company Intel has invested $1 billion here, making it the first high-tech processing plant in Vietnam. General Manager Rick Howarth says the red carpet has been rolled out for them, but there have been challenges. What I find in the government is a willingness. They want to grow their industry. They want to go change their economy. They're very conservative, um, and they're conservative because they just don't know, and they don't have the, the resources of some of the other countries around here that they can make mistakes. And so they're very uh, methodical. They ask lots of questions, which I think is prudent. Again, trying not to make a mistake that will go send them in the wrong direction. This is the tension Vietnam faces. The desire to modernize and the government's innate caution. The use of the internet is an example of that. They encourage it, but they want to keep some control. Although there are established international social networking sites, they created their own state-run version called Go.vn. Vice Minister of the Ministry of Information and Communication, Do Gui Duan, is clear why that is. Nhất là chúng ta biết là internet, trên internet nó đúng là một cái kho trí thức khổng lồ. Nhưng bên cạnh những cái trí thức tốt, những cái bổ ích cho cuộc sống thì cũng có những người đưa lên những cái thông tin không tốt, ví dụ như là những cái hình ảnh kích động dâm ô, đồi trụy, kích động bạo lực, rồi là thậm chí là chia rẽ cái sự đoàn kết của các dân tộc trên thế giới, vân vân và vân vân, có rất nhiều cái mặt hạn chế như vậy. Vấn đề quan trọng là chúng ta biết được những mặt hạn chế đó để chúng ta tìm cách để giảm thiểu nó. Vietnam wants to make friends with the world, but does further economic development for this country require a more open and transparent society? I think this is going to be a slow process. Uh, I don't think they will. I think they will begin by letting go of key things like interest rates and credit rationing. Um, but over a period of time, again, this is not something that's going to change in the next two years. Foreign investors are hoping for a Vietnam in five years that has an independent central bank, a floating exchange rate, an open capital account, then they're going to be disappointed. If 
growth slows in terms of economic, if economic growth slows and you start seeing unemployment rise, this could create social problems, uh, anti-government sentiment, and this is something that the government is very fearful of. Vietnam is marching forward, but it comes at a cost. Not far from the Batexo Tower stood the Eden Building, home to the Givral Café, favorite haunt of Graham Greene, author of The Quiet American, and once the offices of Associated Press. But despite months of protests, it's now being demolished, making way for apartments and shops. Sometimes we had to pay. <laughs> That's a trade-off for development. Uh, but uh, coming to uh, Hanoi, to some uh, own parts of Hanoi, sometimes I feel uh, sorry because I, I really miss uh, Hanoi uh, about two or three decades ago.